I definitely found him credible. Pepper says, ouch. I found him troubled. I found him disturbed in a lot of ways by the things that went on earlier in his life. His, dis his deposition is also contained in the book, which Pepper explained was important so the readers could judge the statements for themselves. What I wanted to do was to make sure that the entire deposition of these critical moments and this critical information was there so that once we could go and read the depositions and see what was what was being actually what was being accurate. Besides describing what he had heard Bland tell his father, Ron Atkins described the many visits made to Russell Sr. by Clyde Tolson, J. Edgar Hoover's right hand man, known to Ron as Uncle Clyde. The high level FBI official often delivered cash to the elder Atkins for jobs he and his association his and his associates would carry out on the behalf of Hoover. In case y'all don't know, who was also a, a self-hating black man who was biracial, who hated every drop of black blood in him to the point where he thought that he could kill everything outside of himself and even kill allegedly family members that he thought that would uh, open up his secret. And if you don't believe me, just do the research. J. Edgar Hoover was black. Among those, the younger Atkins said were paid to supply information about the activities of Martin Luther King were the Reverends Samuel Billy Kyles and Jesse Jackson. <sighs> that hurt me so bad. That's why I can't I can't mess with Jesse no more. And there's a lot of people that act like this is not a reality. But at the end of the day, uh, Jesse Jackson and Samuel Kyles, he's dead now. Billy Kyles. They were supplied information about Dr. King. Um, if you seek out any information in, from mainstream source about James Earl Way, you'll often find him described as the killer of Martin Luther King, just as Harvey uh, Lee Harvey Hosball and Sirhan Sirhan are labeled assassins in the murder of Robert and John Kennedy. But once you read all in any of Pepper's three books on the King slaying, you will see very clearly that Ray is not a killer at all. Instead, he was a petty criminal who was left a perfect follower. Like Oswald and Sirhan, Ray was set up to take the fall for an assassination that originated within the American deep state. In fact, Pepper says he's convinced that knowledge of the plot went all the way to the top. The whole thing would have been part of Lyndon Johnson's playbook, Pepper says. I think Johnson knew about this. Why not? As the official story of the press goes, at 5.50 p.m. on April 4th, my birthday by the way, Kyle's knock on the door of room 306 of the Lorraine Motel to let King and the rest of the, his party know that they were running late for a planned uh, dinner at Kyle's home. Kyle then walked about 60 feet down the balcony where he remained even after Kennedy came out of the room at about 6 p.m. Although Kyle's has maintained ever since that he spent the last half hour in the room, Pepper has proven otherwise. Well, the guy even admitted it, his own self. He said he got out of the way so they could get a clean shot. So, I me, mean, there's no, he admitted it. You know, time has a way and your memory has a way of sometimes slipping you and leaving you. And you end up admitting things that you never thought you would. Uh, Andrew Young and others on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel pointing to where the shot originated while King lies at their feet. Members of a militant black organizing group, the invaders who were also staying at the motel because of King's visit, were told shortly before the shooting by a member of the motel staff that their rooms would no longer be being paid for by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC, and that they had to leave immediately. When they asked who had given this order, they were told it was Jesse Jackson. At the time of the shooting, Jackson was waiting down by the swimming pool. Ron Atkins also identified Jackson as the person who called the owners of the Lorraine Motel and demanded that King be moved from a more secure inner courtyard room to an exposed room on the second floor facing the street. 
You want me? You, I'm gonna repeat that. Ron Atkins also identified Jackson as the person who called the owners of the Lorraine Motel and demanded that King be moved from a more secure inner courtyard room to an exposed room on the second floor facing the street. The Memphis Police Department usually formed a detail of black officers to protect King when he was in town, but not this time. Emergency tax support units were pulled back from the Lorraine to the fire station, which overlooked the motel. Pepper also learned that the only two black members of the Memphis um, Fire Department, I mean, of the Memphis, yes, Fire de Department, had been told the day before the shooting not to report to work the next day at the fire station. And black detective Ed Reddick was told an hour before the shooting to stay home because a threat had been made on his life. Just a minute after King exited his room, a single shot was fired, and the bullet ripped through King's jaw and spinal cord, dropping him immediately. The shot appeared to come from across Mulberry Street, and King was rushed to the hospital, where he was pronounced dead just after 7 p.m. According to the official story, the shot was fired by Ray from the bathroom of a rooming house above the bar called Jim's Grill which backed onto Mulberry and faced onto South Main Street. But as Pepper's investigation proves, the shot actually came from the bushes located in between the rooming house and the street. In fact, the only witnesses who placed Ray at the scene was a falling down drunk named Charles Stevens, who later did not even recognize Ray in the photograph. And the cab driver, James McCraw, had refused to transport a short time because he was too intoxicated. The bushes that concealed the shooter were conveniently trimmed the day after the shooting, giving a false impression that a shooter could not have been concealed there. Several witnesses, including Journalist Earl Caldwell and King's Memphis driver Solomon Jones described seeing the shot come from the bushes and not from the bathroom of the rooming house, as the official story states. Another casualty of the King's murder was cab driver Buddy Butler, who reported that he saw a man running from the scene right after the shot going south on Mulberry Street and jumping into a police car. This will turn out to be MPD Lieutenant Earl Clark. Butler reported to his dispatcher and later to fellow cab driver Louis Ward. Butler was interviewed at the Yellow Cab Company later that evening by police. Ward was told the next day that Butler had either fallen or was pushed to his death from a speeding car on the Memphis Arkansas Bridge. Wow. Wow. Y'all see how these police is dirty and y'all want us to have faith in the police? They're nothing but a brand and a branch of the the slave patrol, the catchers, the killers. This is crazy. The owner of Jim's Grill, Lloyd Jowers, would later admit to being part of the conspiracy to kill King and he would be found responsible along with various government agencies for killing in a 1999 civil lawsuit by the King family. You know, what I hated about that situation was that um, they only took $100 because they didn't want these people to think that they were just in it for money. I wouldn't give a damn what they thought. They killed my husband or my father. I wouldn't give it there, and I think the family should have sued the federal government, and I, I don't want to second guess um, Coretta. I mean, she's gone now, and I'm not saying that the money, your kids end up fighting over money. So, I mean, I, I don't understand, because if it hadn't been the other way around, white people would have sued you so fast that your head would have spent. And it's not important what they thought. You know, we always worried about what did we think, what they think, just like an abused kid. Just like an abused kid. I mean, 
The King family got enormous comfort out of the results of the trial and the evidence that came forward from them. Betty Spates, a waitress at Jim's Grill and girlfriend Jowers, says she saw him rush into the back of the grill through a back door seconds after Martin was shot, white as a ghost and holding a rifle, which he then wrapped in a tablecloth and hid under a shelf under the counter. He turned to her and said, Betty, you wouldn't do anything to hurt me, would you? She responded, of course not, Lloyd. Spates, who didn't come forward until the 1990s, also recounted that Jowers had been delivered a large sum of money right before the assassination. James McCraw stated that Jowers had shown him a rifle the day after the shooting and told him that it was the one he used to kill Dr. King. We confronted Lloyd, Peppers explained. We told him he was likely to be indicted if he didn't help us, if he didn't give more information. Jowers didn't know there was no way the grand jury was going to indict him. All he knew was what he did and what he participated in, how much money he got for it, and what happened. He got quite a large sum of money, built a taxi cab company with it, had his gambling debt with the local mob figure forgiven. Um, his, his debt was owed with a lot, local mafia figure named Frank Liberto. Liberto, an associate of Louisiana crime boss Carlos Marcella Solo, turned out to be involved in the assassination also. He owned a produce warehouse in one of his regular customers, John McFerrin, was making his weekly shopping trip there when he overheard Liberto shout into the phone an hour before the shooting, shoot the son of a bitch on the balcony. Nathan Whitlock and his mother, Aveda Addison Whitlock, who owned a restaurant frequently by Liberto, stated that Liberto had told him he was responsible for King's murder. Oh, bo, bo.